I would like to pass over to Vincent van Pettigem, the uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister of Belgium. It is a real uh, pleasure to have Vincent with us today. As I said earlier to Vincent, um, sometimes in our European debates we forget actually who is hosting us day by day, and that is Belgium. It is a very, very um, nice place to live in, and we're very proud to be here, and we're very proud to be associated with this country, and it is therefore an absolute pleasure, Vincent, for you to open our conference today. Plus, it is becoming an increasing place for the use of fintech and attracting fintech in Europe. With that, Vincent, I'd like to pass over to you and thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Nicholas, and thank you, Anne. Thank you very much as well for uh, the introduction. And I'm, of course, very pleased and honored to be invited to uh, this event. And ladies and gentlemen, dear participants at this uh, FinTech and Regulation Conference, our future is digital. Our future is FinTech. It is big, it is everywhere, and it should be on top of our agendas. And that is, of course, why we are all here today. So I will take the opportunity to share with you some of my views as a Minister of Finance, but also as a, custom, a consumer. But of course, I'm also looking forward to listening to you. I had a look at uh, the program already, and I have to say, the speakers list is quite impressive. A long list of innovators, of experts, legislators, and supervisors. And it's really the combination of all you, all speakers and participants that will shape the future of our FinTech ecosystem. And we know that our future is digital. And so will be our financial system. But we need to ask one important question. How will these financial evolutions serve our consumers? And I stress consumers, not customers. So how, how can fintech work for the people and not vice versa? How can we make sure people have a similar level of trust in their banking app than in their bank officer? So this, of course, raises the question, what will be the impact of the digital transition on our financial services? How will this impact the way we do banking? New technologies, of course, bring new opportunities, but new technologies also disrupt old ones. Similar to how Airbnb changed the hotel sector and Uber put the tax industry upside down, FinTech will disrupt the banking system as we know it nowadays. Bank offices are disappearing, whilst FinTech apps are booming. Of course, these apps create tons of opportunities, but let's remain vigilant. We need to have everyone on board. Digital literacy will be an important challenge. Before I became minister, I was mayor in a small town, the Pinta. When banks started to close their local offices, people started to approach me. These people are worried. How will they continue to do banking? Where will they get their cash money in order to pay at the bakery? So I'm looking forward to this conference, to the upcoming debates on our future financial system. Definitely a more digital one, but one that is serving our consumers. So ladies and gentlemen, if I had to choose one major message today, it is definitely the following. We need to develop financial technologies that work for the people, not the other way around. That should be a guiding principle throughout this conference. And that message becomes even more important as the COVID pandemic forced people into these new technologies. It was not merely out of choice, but rather out of necessity that we embrace these fintech solutions. People were forced to drop cash payments and to do payments contactless or online. And the numbers are clear. In the European Union, online payments now represent about one third of all transactions, whilst that was only one fifth at the beginning of the pandemic. But also the online identity verification apps boomed. 
For example, It's Me, a Belgian online verification app, got over millions of users in a very short amount of time. The Brussels expats in this conference will surely know the app as it is linked to our COVID safe certificate, which of course explains also its success. So the pandemic clearly accelerated how we are doing transactions in a digital world. In one year, we achieved what could have taken a decade otherwise. Because in normal times, it takes a lot of time to build the trust needed to move innovations forward. In order for society to follow suit, we first need to believe in the system, see the added value and trust the mechanisms behind. But of course, when talking about advantages and opportunities, we also do need to address risk and challenges. These are two sides of the same coin. Because in the end, digital finance is still finance. And when moving banking from physical offices to the online web, risk and challenges remain. And some risks even increase, not to talk about cyber risks, money laundering, and challenging beca challenges become more challenging, like consumer protection. But before jumping into these risks and challenges, and into the role that governments and regulators should play, I would like to begin by outlining the main fintech opportunities. And I'm quite sure, with all these experts and innovators around the table, that all of you will agree. The opportunities are ample. First of all, fintech can bring financial services closer to consumers. Fintech can give better access to financial services all over the world. It can increase digital literacy and advance financial inclusion, which is important because access to financial services is important. For example, without the possibility to open a bank account, it becomes very hard for people to participate in society, to build up capital, to buy goods and services. So fintech has the potential to reduce costs and barriers for vulnerable people, and it thereby helps reducing inequalities. Fintech can also present complex financial products and services in a more straightforward way. Information and advice about financial products is often complicated, and it can be difficult for consumers to understand the risk and compare the products. Innovative applications can help. These apps identify the key risk features of a product rather than overwhelming consumers with pages of legal documents. And financial technologies can also help consumers get a better overview of their financial situation. And it can provide consumers with a larger choice of financial products. So there are clear advantages that fintech brings and will bring to consumers. And I deliberately emphasize this because fintechs should work for our consumers. It should serve consumers, not the other way around. But secondly, fintechs also, fintech also provides tremendous opportunities for entrepreneurs, for startups and scale-ups. Fintech can make it easier for people with innovative ideas to find them. New forms of accessing financial services, such as crowdfunding or peer-to-peer -peer lending, directly link savings with investments. They make the market more accessible for starters. For example, the crowdfunding regulation introduced European crowdfunding license. This will help crowdfunding platforms to scale up in Europe. And this in turn will help to match investors and companies from all over the European Union, giving entrepreneurs the chance to pitch their ideas to a wider base of funders. Of course, FinTech not only helps startups finding financing, it also helps companies through the labyrinth of regulations they face. For example, FinTech can help companies to implement ESG standards. 
Because if we want investors to show the way towards green investments, we need companies to correctly disclose how green they are. But of course, this involves massive administrative efforts. And at that stage, FinTech gets involved. For example, Greenomi, a Belgium-based FinTech, helps companies to comply with the new European rules on sustainable finance. By digitalizing the data capturing and reporting process, the burdensome administrative work become much easier. And this is clearly needed, as we see that Euroclear, for example, recently bought a big stake in this fintech company. Apart from the advantages that fintech offers for consumers and companies, fintech also creates opportunities for the European Union as a global player. New digital technologies have the capacity to truly strengthen the EU's strategic autonomy. But first, what do we mean by strategic autonomy? It means to be more resilient as a continent and have more influence. It means to be less dependent on others. And of course, interdependence is natural in today's globalized world. It is even desirable, but over-dependence on other parts of the world is not. But at the same, strategic autonomy is not closing our continent. I therefore prefer to speak about open strategic autonomy. Therefore, also our financial ecosystem should keep up with global evolutions. We need to ensure that our policies are developed with a view to strengthening our European strategic autonomy. We need to facilitate payments in euro between the European Union and other parts of the world. Because a more international role of the euro could significantly reduce our dependence on other parts of the world. We need an environment in which European payment solutions are at the forefront. We cannot become fully dependent on other global players, such, such as issuers of global stablecoins or international card schemes. So to counter our dependence on major international card schemes, not to name Visa and MasterCard, the European Payments Initiative has been launched. The European Payment Initiative is basically a group of major European banks creating a unified payment solution across Europe. In Belgium, we fully support this ambitious project because at the moment, American payment providers are responsible for four out of five payments in Europe. This also means that foreign companies are holding an incredible amount of European data. So by creating European payments initiatives, we not only become less dependent on foreign card schemes, we also protect our citizens' data. And we all know in the digital age, this data is gold. Of course, providing safe European payment solutions and not becoming overly reliant on foreign players is not a prerogative of industry. Also, central banks need to innovate if they want to remain relevant. The European Central Bank, like other central banks, is examining the issuance of a central bank digital currency. This could be a safe public alternative to the magnitude of private cryptocurrencies. A digital euro would be safe form of currency that matches the digital world. And this could significantly enhance the EU's strategic autonomy. For users, a digital euro would combine the convenience and security of digital currencies with the regulation and stability of central bank money. Therefore, we fully support the European Central Bank further examining a digital euro. But of course, we have to do things right. Any possible risk should be carefully assessed before introducing a digital euro. Ladies and gentlemen, after having outlined the opportunities of these financial technologies, 
for both consumers and companies and for the European Union as a global actor, I would like to have a look at the role of governments. To summarize this role in one sentence, governments need to create the best possible environment to make innovation, innovative ideas happen. For me, uh, government's role is there, thereby threefold. First, we need to reduce the barriers for fintech to develop. Second, we need to minimize the potential risks and create confidence. And third, we need to guide the way and make the necessary investments. So first of all, fintech still faces several barriers in order to fully exploit its potential. The financial services sector is traditionally known for its high entry barriers. In order to achieve competitive financial sector, bringing benefits for the whole of our society, we need effective competition. This allows innovative companies to enter the market. This creates better products at cheaper prices. And in turn, this will force the existing Pay, uh, the existing companies to also innovate. For example, due to the new digital payment services, traditional banks also need to innovate if they want to remain relevant. In order to further remove barriers, we need to deepen our European Capital Markets Union. For example, innovative solution developed in one member state should be allowed to expand easily and freely in other markets. No legal or practical barriers should hinder this. Startups should also be able to easily find financing cross-border. They need to be able to tap the full potential of our capital markets. Lowering barriers to entry and to finance is key to financial innovation. The European Union crowdfunding regulation, as explained earlier, is a perfect example. Secondly, regulations need to limit the risks linked to fintech and create confidence. Financial technologies are developing quickly, and we need to make sure our rules and regulations are fit for the digital age. And this is important in order to create confidence. Even in a quickly digitalizing world, what does not change is the need for confidence. Users of financial services need to have this confidence. They need to be sure that their transactions are safe, that their assets are protected, and that they have a freedom of choice. But also the different players in the financial sector need confidence. Confidence in one another and confidence in the regulatory framework. Therefore, we need to follow one guiding principle. Same activity, same risks, same rules. The European Payment Service Directive is an excellent example. It makes sure that all new companies entering the payment sector, whoever they are or wherever they come from, are subject to the same level of regulation and supervision. So a regulatory framework needs to be clear and fair, but it also needs to be balanced. When designing legislation, innovation should be on top of mind. So regulation always needs to balance between encouraging innovation and protecting consumers. Of course, this balancing act implies that we as governments, as regulators and supervisors are involved in the innovation. Thereby, I am glad to have the opportunity to attend this conference so we can listen to each other's concerns. Another important element of regulation is, of course, to protect consumers. Phishing is a considered the biggest cyber risk among business in the financial sector. And many of us already received fake messages or emails from apparent financial service providers. And during COVID, this became even more prominent. Because teleworking further increases their reliance on email for communication, thereby creating perfect conditions for fraud schemes. So it is clear we need to regulate and protect consumers for these types of fraud. 
And finally, as governments, we need to set the tone. We need to guide the way. We need to invest in the digital transition because public investment will also mobilize the much needed private funds. The European Recovery Fund, the next generation EU, fully recognizes the important role of digitalization. When, you, when countries get European money out of this fund, at least 20% should be spent on digital projects. With 27%, Belgium spent significantly more than required on the digital transition. The federal government is, for example, investing 30 million euros in an e-inclusion e project. This incubator aims to tackle inequalities such as the access to online banking and the use of e-commerce. Moreover, the Belgian federal investment company increasingly focuses on digitalization. Last year, the subsidiary, the relaunch SF. SFPIM was set up to help finance our recovery and transition. Through this fund, we want to support Belgium companies that invest, among other things, in the digital transition. Needless to say, this offers many opportunities for FinTech. And that's right, because they will be at the forefront making our economies fully digital and future-proof. So it's clear Belgium counts on fintech for the economic recovery and is willing to invest in it. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm getting uh, towards the end of my speech. By now, at the European level, we know where we are going. We know how to get there and we know what to do. We have a clear view on the opportunities and strengths, on the risks and challenges. For this, we need clear rules and regulations that encourage the much needed innovation to drive the digital transition. We have the people, we have the tools to make our future digital. And of course, we will do it our own way. It will be a human and values-based way that serves our citizens. We will develop financial technologies that work for the people, not the other way around. I can only conclude by saying that our European digital future is promising. We have the entrepreneurs, we have the researchers, we have, we have the high-tech workers, we have the talent and the tools to be successful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Minister, Prime Minister, Mr. Pettigem. Uh, from Pettigam, apologies, and most importantly, Vincent, for this very, very good speech. I think there's a number of things, there's many things to take out of this, but there's a few things I really take out of this. That technology needs to work for the people. And I liked what you said at the end about it being a human and value-based approach to the use of technology. Something I think Europe stands for, and you talked about Europe's role in, in forming standards. I think it's also reassuring to hear both how you encourage this within Belgium and I feel reassured in your role as a member of ECOFIN in pushing these issues into the European debate, which is very, very encouraging. And finally, I thought that was, uh, I'm not sure whether that was intended or not, but actually the next panel looks at what we can learn from the Payment Services Directive as an approach to regulation and technology, because you mentioned that explicitly as a good example of how to go for a same risk, same regulation approach. And so thank you very much indeed for being with us, provoking us at the beginning of this conference. And hopefully we can see you again, maybe even in person at some stage at one of our future events. Thank you so much indeed for being with us, Vincent. Thank you. My pleasure. Have uh, lots of success today. Bye-bye. Thank you. All the best.